In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about collation issues, fast loading, recovery, and Scram authentication. I'm Creston Jameson, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 72. All right, I hope you're having a great week. The first piece of content is ICU collations against glibc 2.28 data corruption. And this is from cybertech-postgresql.com. And they're basically talking about changes to glibc with version 2.28 could cause uh, corruption of data, mostly for how things are ordered. And it could cause issues with indexes, for example, maybe unique indexes, basically now storing more than one. In other words, it's no longer unique based upon the collation changes, or you could get ordering differences once your OS upgrades to 2.28. So for example, I checked uh, Ubuntu and the most recent LTS version was at 2.27, so not quite at 2.28. So basically they reiterate here, why is it a problem? Basically the result of order by clauses and select statements in the order of keys and B-tree indexes. So that could lead to incorrect query results, as they say here, or to duplicate entries in unique indexes. Now you can do a re-index command. Thankfully, version 12 coming up has re-index concurrently, but we don't have that in our versions today. But what this post talks about is potentially moving to ICU collations, as opposed to relying on the glibc ones. Now, more of this was discussed in a previous episode of Scaling Postgres with this post here, Beware of Your Next GLibC Upgrade, talking about this issue. And he demonstrates some of it with two different versions of GLibC. And if you're interested, I also encourage you to check out the comments because here they're talking about where they had the issues with the duplicate key violations on unique constraints with some of their indexes and kind of what they had to do to work through this. So basically, this is a problem to be aware of. And this post talks about, hey, maybe you potentially want to change to ICU correlations because it would be a little bit more independent than the glibc changes. And they list several advantages here of moving to ICU, such as they work the same on all operating systems. You can actually create your own correlations. You can use case and accident and sensitive correlations. They're versioned. But the unfortunate fact of the matter is he says here, quote, you cannot use ICU collations as default collation for a database or a cluster. So you have to explicitly specify them for all table columns. So and he said, this restriction may be lifted at some point in the future. So basically this would be a pain to do. But if you wanted to go ahead and move it to ICU collation, he goes over and describes kind of how they're uh, laid out, how to create them, how you can uh, update the versions using ultra correlation refresh version, how to actually switch to ICU correlations. Again, you have to do it per table. And of course you have to re-index your indexes. But of course the issue that he also talks about is how to do this without downtime. And it's basically using logical replication. And the post finishes through describing how you could potentially do this. So definitely this is something to, that's coming down the pike for different OS versions on where you have PostgreSQL installed that you need to be aware of. And it looks like it's mostly just an ordering change, but it could cause greater problems if you have unique indexes on text columns that are impacted by these correlation changes coming in glib 2.28. So it's just something to be aware of and to post for you to check out. The next post is fastest way to load data into PostgreSQL using Python. And the subtitle here is from two minutes to less than half a second. And this is from hockeybenita.com. Now, basically they have retrieved data and using Python went through a number of different steps on what's the fastest way to load uh, hundreds of thousands of rows of data. Now, this is a very long post, pretty Python centric, not so much uh, PostgreSQL, although the ideas are, are still there. Basically uh, a single inserts are usually slower, multi-line inserts are faster. Although interestingly, that wasn't that significant in his uh, tests he has here. At the very bottom, he covers his results summary of the different iterations that, that he did and the execute many actually didn't improve it by that much. But then of course the fastest one is using cop the copy command. And he had a way of parsing the data out and using the copy command and that's what got it down to this 
less than half a, from 128 seconds doing one insert at a time to half a second. So definitely if you're a Python developer, this has some insight to be gained on how you can load data pretty quickly. Uh, but the general rule is single inserts, one at a time are the slowest ones. Doing a multi-line insert gives you better performance. And then the copy command is probably the fastest one. And this is similar to what I found in a video tutorial I did uh, talking about Ruby. So it's fast PostgreSQL data loading using Ruby. And again, it showed the same results. Single inserts the time slowest, multi inserts, multiple rows per inserts faster, and then the copy command is the fastest. So if you're a Python or Ruby developer, you could potentially check out these two pieces of content. The next post is Big News in Databases Summer 2019. And this for, is from windend.at. And this is his newsletter. And kind of the subtitle for the page title here is the SQL standard extensions and cloud war. So basically he talks about how the SQL standard continues to grow. And this is something this individual regularly monitors the changes to SQL and tracks them between the Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, PostgreSQL, DB2, all the relational databases on how it's keeping up with the standards. And they're talking about introducing things like a multi-dimensional arrays, things like actually a graph query language, GQL, and also some streaming data related features. And then with reference to the cloud wars he mentioned, basically there's this quote, new add-on features, options, and management packs are only available in Oracle Cloud and on engineered systems. This means only on Oracle hardware, which is interesting. So you could no longer get it and install it on your own hardware. And he has the subtitle here, cloud war strange allies working against your own hardware. So again, this is another great thing about PostgreSQL is that it's open source and you can take it and run it wherever you want or run it on a cloud environment and pretty much get the same thing. And then he also goes into different discussions about um, some technology and science, some new releases for the different database systems that he tracks, as well as new content he's created, as well, well as some other areas. So definitely, if you're interested in more uh, news-related items for this uh, summer of 2019, definitely a blog post to check out. The next post is PostgreSQL and recovery.conf. And this is from Luca Ferrari at flucan1978.github.io. And he's referring to the fact that with version 12 of Postgres, the recovery.com file is removed. Uh, and he says here that the server will literally not start with it. So they've moved all of the things that you configured in recovery.conf into the main postgresql.com file, or if you included files with it. There's also some new uh, potential files that trigger files that get created, a standby signal and a recovery signal. Basically, a standby is a hot standby and recovery, it recovers to the point it is ready to take on a primary duties. And he makes a point that, you know, some of the reasons why this was done is he says, quote, this makes them moving them into PostgreSQL.conf makes them a good candidate to be changed by an alter system statement. So basically, when you upgrade to version 12, you need to make sure that your processes take this into account or your backup recovery software that you're using takes this into account to handle the absence of this file, as well as putting the configuration in the main postgresql.conf config file. The next post is how to upgrade your PostgreSQL passwords to Scram. And so with version PostgreSQL 10, they've added Scram authentication as an option. So it's a much more secure and standardized versions of doing a password management for your users. Uh, they go over a brief overview of Scram and what it is. It's basically an acronym that's Salted Challenge Response Authentication Mechanism. And they go through the steps of how to upgrade from, uh, you know, determine if you can upgrade to Scram because there's some things that can't use Scrams. So, so for example, my to my knowledge, PG Bouncer by default does not support Scram. I think there may be some GitHub patches that may allow it, but uh, by default, I don't think it does at this time. Uh, the next step is validate your PG HPA comp settings, uh, and they suggest having MD5 for your users that are connecting. Change a PostgreSQL's password authentication method, so basically set it to Scramsha256. Determine who needs to upgrade, so they give you a script that you can look through the users that need to upgrade to use Scram. 
upgrade each user's password. So each user's password needs to be reset. And they give you uh, two methods to discuss how to do this. One thing they mentioned here you want to avoid is don't use ultra roll username, password, new password, because the plain text password could, could end up being logged. So that kind of defeats <laughs> some of the greater security improvements with Scram. And lastly, update your pghba.conf to use only scramshaw 256. Now, because you change this, change this in the pghba.conf file, you could, so for example, if you do have utilities that don't support Scram yet, you could have, say, general users that are connecting interactively to use Scram, but maybe PG Bouncer you could leave on MD5, for example. But if you're interested in moving to Scram, here's a process you can use. The next post is actually a YouTube channel, and this is the ITPUG, Italian PostgreSQL Users Group, and they recently had a, a PG Day in Italy 2019. So they posted a number of videos. The first set is for the individual speakers, basically uh, who they are and what they're talking about in their presentations, and they're relatively short, one to three minutes. Then they have the greater presentations here that occurred at uh, PG Day IT. Now, I did notice some of them uh, are in Italian or a, a language that was not English. But if you're interested in video content, there may be some presentations here you'd like to check out. The next post is Implementing Autonomous Transactions in Postgres. And this is from cybertech-postgresql.com. And he says, what is an autonomous transaction? It's basically you want to send off or fire and forget some sub-transactions that are not connected to the main transactions. So you're in a transaction, you're doing some sort of work and you want to send some sort of notification. And he says here, mostly logging, auditing, progress tracking into some table. So basically this information would persist even if the transactions rolled back. Now he said there's a hacky way to do it where someone literally uses the copy command to essentially write something to a file but it has some downsides regarding the cryptic structure. Copy program has a super user requirement and you need physical access to the database server to read the log. Another alternative he thought up was using a DB link. So it's creating a separate link to the database and inserting into a particular table. And then another alternative is using uh, PL Python in some Python driver, again, to make a connection and do an insert into the database. Now, interestingly, I wonder if you had a requirement for this if there is another alternative potentially using uh, an asynchronous asynchronous notification mechanism listen and notify essentially i wonder if these types of notifications would work and still be essentially fire and forget whereas the transaction gets rolled back so if you have a requirement for something like this definitely a blog post to check out the next post is the database deficit how full stack developers blind spot harms agile teams now, this is not uh, explicitly related to PostgreSQL, uh, although he does in general talk about relational databases, and it is an opinion piece. But basically, he's talking about with full stack developers, and particularly with the rise of Node.js and being able to use one language on the client and the backend server side, essentially, keeping track of all the different changes that are happening. Basically, the database side gets the short end of the stick usually in terms of the skill set in a, you know, quote, full stack developer. So it's interesting piece talking about this database deficit and kind of what some examples look like to like not using a migration strategy for schema changes. And this is something I've quite thought often about is the developers that basically don't spend a lot of time focusing on the database side. They focus on everything uh, else but. But it's an interesting opinion piece, and I definitely encourage you to check it out if this type of content is interesting to you. The next post is PostgreSQL Wall Retention and Cleanup, PG Archive Cleanup. So this is a utility that you can use to be able to clean up wall archives. And he basically describes this built-in command that's provided with PostgreSQL. You can use it as a dry run to see what potential files would be removed and then do it in a delete mode. But again, what's critical is do not run this in your main PostgreSQL data directory, like the PG wall directly or PG X log directory. Uh, do not do that. Only do it to archive destinations because otherwise you'll corrupt your database. 
But of course, in using this utility, again, the consideration is you need to make sure not to delete wall that you're needed. And they go through four different criteria here that are very important to follow in terms of being able to restore your database to a point in time. So if you're going to be using this utility for cleaning up your wall archives, definitely check out this blog post and follow their criteria to ensure that you're only deleting the wall files that you intend to. The next post is generate primary keys almost automatically. And this is from Luca Ferrari at fluca1978.github.io. And he's talking about he was recently looking at a quite large database with a lot of tables. And essentially, almost all tables did not have a primary key. So basically, he went through and developed a couple of different ways that you could query the database looking at the system tables and generate queries where you can automatically generate a primary key. And at first he just used, and he used a couple of different methods. So he used this CTE method to be able to generate this and then you could run this file against the database. And then he used a function that offers the ability to add different parameters to be able to control how uh, the SQL generation works. And then he actually did everything within a uh, procedure to execute the alter table commands. So three different ways to do it. So if you ever need to run a lot of different commands using information that's located in the system tables, definitely a blog post to check out. Last post is serving dynamic vector tiles from PostGIS. Now again, I don't know that much at all about PostGIS, but if you're interested in content where you need to serve you know, these dynamic vector tiles, here's a new blog post that covers these techniques. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode, or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.